Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today, we have got episode number 43 for you all, and we are going to be giving you our second edition of NBA Power Rankings. It's been a little bit over a month since we gave our first edition. I feel like that's a good a good rhythm, a good cadence to it. Um, so we're probably going to be doing these monthly. So this is our Power Rankings 2.0 edition episode. Before we get into that, we do have to recap the first ever ever inaugural in-season tournament championship. You can see the Lakers fan over there got his shirt on. LeBron, hey, in-season tournament championship and MVP. I don't think Jordan got either of those. That's five rings to me. That's just, I don't make the rules. <laughs> uh, but yeah, definitely going to recap that. Got to talk about, you know, my Cowboys showing up on Sunday Night Football. Got themselves yes, a nice marquee win so we can stop all that noise that they haven't been a good team. I'm going to wrap up the show with a little, a little something different today. Going to do some NBA trivia. Uh, I think that'll be fun. So quickly going to get the housekeeping out of the way. YouTube, like, comment, subscribe if you're on audio platforms. Pre-download the show. Drop a five-star rating. It helps us out a ton. And follow the socials there at the bottom of the screen, at Off The Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off The Glass Podcast on TikTok. I did see we hit over 100 followers on the TikTok, so we appreciate the support. Continue to continue to follow and like the videos that y'all see on those platforms. Um, we're going to go ahead and write, get right into it. I'm pretty sure I know the answer already, but Dame, how are we doing today, bro? I'm feeling great, man. I'm feeling good. I we just won the NBA championship, man. I just <laughs> I can't I can't it can't get much better than that, bro. We popping champagne. Brian got another MVP. I ain't got nothing to complain about. I'm doing good. Hey, look, I I think I said it on the, the episode that we recorded with Drew that this was probably as good as the NBA could have hoped for. For yeah, this in our world, you know, this first time of doing the end season tournament, um, the knockout round, the energy in the arena wasn't the same, but the the play on the court, the intensity did not drop off from what we were seeing from those first set of games, you know, in Indiana or, you know, in, in uh, Milwaukee, like the energy in the arena might not have been there, but the intensity stayed. Um, and we got ourselves what I thought was a really, really good championship game Saturday night between the Indiana Pacers and the Los Angeles Lakers. Obviously the Lakers had to beat the New Orleans Pelicans to get to this game. Um, they didn't just beat them. They really kind of just beat the brakes off of them, to be yeah. honest with you. Um, honestly, I was pretty disappointed with how the Pelicans came out in that game. They were down by 40 at one point, I think. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Zion did not show up in this game. He did not look like he had the same energy that I was expecting to see from him. A lot of people were questioning his performance in that quarterfinal game against the Kings, but I kind of chalked it up to, you know, Brandon Ingram had it going. He didn't have to do too much. It kind of just, he just played in his role of the game. If he had to step up, I figured that he would. This was a game where it felt like he could kind of match the Lakers physicality. And that was not the case at all. The Lakers dominated them really in every single aspect um, obviously, the final score of that game being 133 to 89, um, held BI to nine points, Zion to 13 points. It just was, it was rough going all around for the Pelicans. So, that's how the Lakers got into that game. On the Pacers side of things, they had a tough matchup against the Milwaukee Bucks, which was a game that came down pretty much was tight all the way through um, and down the stretch in the fourth quarter. Tyrese Halliburton had another one of those special moments where he is hitting step back threes, the most notable one. He broke off Brook Lopez on the wing. He knocked down what would ultimately end up being the dagger in that game. And uh, he checked his watch. He said, y'all thought it was Dame time. He said, it's my time now, um, which was, that's a, look, people want to say that it's too early to, you know, call a guy a superstar. It's not the playoffs. It's not this, not that. Whatever you want to say, you call him a superstar or not, that is a superstar type moment Fact. to be doing that on that stage in a winner go home game. Whatever your thoughts are about the end season tournament, it's clear that everybody was playing hard. Giannis was playing hard this entire <laughs> game. He finished with 37 uh, and 10 boards um, in 41 minutes. He was shooting phenomenally from the free throw line. He was doing everything he could. 
Uh, Damian Lillard kind of got alive there for a little bit um, in the third quarter, but he didn't have the greatest of shooting nights. Um, Chris Middleton had some moments in this game. Like there were a lot of big shots down the stretch. This meant something. This Bucks team was not just going to roll over um, because they felt like this game was meaningless. They wanted to win this game as much as the Pacers did. And ultimately, like I said, Tyrese Halliburton down the stretch hit some big, big, big shots. And that set up the crash course for the game, the championship game on Saturday night. Pacers, Lakers, you had pace versus physicality. You didn't know which one was going to win. And it was very, very clear from the get-go that the Pacers had literally zero answers for the Lakers' size or their physicality. I think the Lakers finished with, I want to double check, but I know they had at least 80 plus points in the paint in this mm-hmm. game. I think we made one three. Yeah, um, no, they, there was the Lakers, I don't think, had a three until the fourth quarter of this game either. It, yeah, it was like, yeah, either late third or fourth. It was one. Three. Um, yes, points in the paint. The Lakers were two points shy of doubling the Pacers' points in the paint. The Pacers had 44, the Lakers had 86 of their 123 points coming from the paint. Unbelievable game from Anthony Davis, who finishes with 41-20 and with four blocks and five assists as well. LeBron adds in 24 points and 11 rebounds with four assists and two steals. Just uh, Austin Reeves, too, coming off the bench, 28 Mm -hmm. points. He was huge in that game. Uh, You could feel the difference in this team as soon as he checks into the floor. So I'm going to defer over to you. Talk to me about what you saw from this Lakers team that worked so well and why they were able to to really shut down this explosive and fast-paced Pacers offense, which no one else was able to do throughout the course of this in-season tournament. Well, the main reason uh, why we were able to slow down the Pacers on offense is because our defense is elite. Okay, We have elite defenders all across the board. Um, obviously Anthony Davis holding it down in the paint, but Cam Reddish stepping up, really buying in on the defensive end of the ball. We got Vando that comes in and plays some good defense. We got TP that comes in and plays some solid defense. Austin Reeves can play defense. We just got some good defense, and honestly, um, I feel like we made a point to get the ball out of Tyrese Halliburton's hands. Like, a lot of times he got doubled, like, earlier into possessions. Um, just seemed like we wanted anybody else to beat us, but it wasn't going to be Halliburton. Like, anybody else on the floor could beat us but him. Um, and it worked out because they couldn't really get much going. Like Tyrese, he creates for pretty much everybody. He runs the whole offense. He is the engine. So when you kind of just disrupt that a little bit, it kind of throws their whole offense like kind of out of whack. Um, so that's what we did defensively. Like you said, offensively, they just had no, they were just too small, bro. Like they were too small, too little. They were getting babied in the paint. Like Anthony Davis, what looked like Shaq, like legitimately he, he looked like Shaq. So um, then you mix that in with LeBron. LeBron is obviously, like, super, super smart when it comes to, you know, basketball IQ. You know, you know, LeBron gets those moments, you know, in certain games where he's chucking a lot of threes, he's taking a lot of shots. Like, now nah, he knew this game. Like, no, just give me the ball in the paint. Like, if, if Anthony Davis is not in, I'll be Anthony Davis really quickly. Give me the ball in the paint and just bully them. Um, mm-hmm. So that's kind of what we did. Like, our size, our length kind of disrupted him a little bit defensively and caused him problems um, on offense. So I feel like that was the main point. Not letting Tyrese Halliburton beat us, utilizing the fact that we have a huge size advantage and the fact that Miles Turner was in foul trouble for most of the game. Um, yeah, we we did what we were supposed to do, man. We came in, you know, we were locked in. LeBron said he wanted to he wanted to play. Got Anthony Davis making the Kobe face. It's like, bro, we when we locked in like that, we we wanted the best, man. We wanted the best. So it was a uh, it was really good to see. Um, yeah, man, I, I mean, I don't really got much to say. Austin, like I said, you brought it up, Austin Reeves. Austin the bench was huge. I think he had, mm-hmm. what, 20 points in the first half, I believe. Um, so he's – I mean, that whole season, we kind of talked about it through the awards. Like, he's kind of been that spark off the bench for us. Um, he comes in, especially those LeBron-less minutes. He kind of control runs the offense a little bit, can score, can facilitate. So that he was big for us. And, yeah, we just – you know, we went out there. We wanted it. You know, the, it, it definitely felt like a playoff game. Like, I felt like I was watching, like, a game one of the finals. Not a game seven. It wasn't like that. But it yeah. was, like, it It could have been, like, a, you know, Western Conference finals, a game one of the finals. Like, it, mm-hmm. it was something like that. Definitely a playoff atmosphere, which was really, really cool. I was locked in the whole time. 
So oh yeah, it was a uh, it was good to see. It was good to see us, you know, win the first ever in season tournament. Yeah, and I think it's cool because I feel like the the refs were officiating it to be like a playoff type game, mm-hmm. um, where you had, like I said, as as much as the Lakers dominated the Pacers on the interior, it wasn't for a lack of effort. Aaron yeah. Neesmith was he was given everything he had Facts. and had a lot of you know very quality defensive plays. He impressed me uh for Indiana throughout this entire tournament. His impact um coming off the bench for this team has been huge um on both sides of the ball. He has moments on offense, but really his defense, his intensity, his hustle, um, playing bigger than his frame. Um, that was huge for them throughout this this you know entire entire in-season tournament. It just it wasn't enough against the Lakers. Like you said, Miles Turner getting into foul trouble hurts. Uh, Isaiah Jackson came in and they they needed his size desperately. But again, none of these people could stop Anthony Davis tonight. When LeBron got down downhill, there was no stopping him from getting to the rim. Um, everybody, really everybody, was able to get to the rim pretty much with ease. Austin Reeves included. Um, so that was really the biggest story. the The question was coming in, you know. Could the Lakers stop this high-powered, fast-paced, historic offense, or um, you know, could the could the Pacers potentially make this a, a run-and-gun type of game and just you know make it a shootout that they end up coming out on top of? And like I said, this I think was the best that anyone has defended the Pacers this season. And you know, maybe maybe you just gave some of these other teams a little bit of a blueprint on how to deal with. Halliburton and this Pacers team, you know, on a nightly basis or, you know, when we get into the playoffs, this is kind of how you have to approach it. Like you said, the Lakers did a great job of trying to disrupt Halliburton. They were picking him up at like half court. They were trapping him high. They were not letting him just freely move about the court like he always does. Um, And that definitely made it difficult four guys to get those what seemingly feels like, you know, always open looks from three every time they play anybody else. Those looks were not there at the same rate. And then obviously you're not in that rhythm so that even when you do get some of those good looks, they're not falling at the the same, you know, clip that they usually do. I think there was a point in this game where they were like five for 20 from three. The Lakers did a really good job of putting a bottle on that um, better than, than anybody else has at this point. Um, and that, that's also- kind of, that's kind of my fault. I didn't mean to cut you off, but like, but, but before I forget it, because you brought you brought it up, like kind of how in the playoffs, how you have to defend the, the this Pacers team. That's the main reason why I said it felt like a playoff game was because they made it a point to get the ball out of Tyrese about Halliburton hands mm-hmm. and have someone else beat them. And you don't see that as much in regular season games where you know you're just playing a whole bunch of games in a week, playing the back to back. Like in a playoff game, obviously a series, you know, you actually lock into your opponent. And like, all right, cool, we're, we're gonna like. Obviously, you're trying to win every night, but like in a playoff game, it's obviously it's heightened a little bit. You right. know, we're reading the scouting report. We're doing everything we can to try to beat them. And that way, I completely agree with what you're saying. Like, I think that's what the Pacers would face when the playoffs come around, like especially obviously seeing it now. But like, I think that would be their biggest problem is like when we can take Tyrese Halliburton, not completely out of the game, but when we could slow him down a little bit and disrupt their rhythm. How can we really respond to that? So I think I, I completely agree with that state, that statement right there. Yeah, and a big reason as to why they were able to, you know, kind of put some clamps on Tyrese, a guy who had the highest plus minus out of everybody on the Lakers, and that's Cam Reddish. Yes, sir. Was a plus 24 Mm -hmm. uh, through 33 minutes on the night. Um, His defensive intensity was off the charts in this one. Between him and Vanderbilt, they know like that every Bro. night. So if so, I can't get like that, come on, man. We, uh, that's what we was talking about already. Like, but listen, defense is a want to thing, bro. Mm-hmm. If you want to play defense, bro, you can be a solid defender, not elite. You know, only a few people got the trace of being an elite defender. But if you really want to, if you buy in, because obviously you look like Cam Reddish is like, all right, cool. That scoring stuff, if it comes to me, it, it comes. I'll get my open looks when they come, but I'll make my mark on the defensive side of the ball. And you clearly see it, it works out. So, listen, defense is a one-two thing. And personally, as 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 someone who's been watching the Lakers team for years, 
bro, I love defense. Like, you can give me – you can say, oh, listen, y'all could be the best three-point shooting team in the league or the best defensive team in the league. I'm taking defense 11 times out of 10. It's not even close. Mm-hmm. Like, watching uh, watching um, elite defense from a team, not just from a player, but, like, team defense, it is the best thing in the world, bro. It's so fun to watch. Yeah, and he just – his point of attack defense all game was huge. He, he ended up, I think, finishing with two or three three steals. Um, and he could have had a couple more. He almost got too handsy on some of them. But mm-hmm. like you said, the, the intensity was there. The defense uh, made a huge, huge impact, specifically from those two, like Cam and Jared Vanderbilt playing the way they did out of the gate. Like from the get-go, you could see it, uh, that they were up in Tyrese Halliburton trying to make him uncomfortable. Um, yeah, this Lakers team – is now the the first ever NBA Cup winners. LeBron James is the first ever NBA Cup <laughs> MVP. Adam San- Adam I don't want to say Adam, Adam Sandler. Sandler. <laughs> Adam, Adam Silver was handing him the trophy. And he was like, I I don't know what other awards we have. Like giving an award to a guy that's won everything else might as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but definitely well deserved. Um, I think there was questions about like if it just applied to this game or the entire tournament. And they clarify that it's like a full tournament award because if it was just this game it has to be anthony davis but no question uh, no question yeah throughout the entire tournament lebron was phenomenal he was watching him against the pelicans was bro i didn't even feel like i was watching lebron i don't know what i was watching that night bro (laughs) bro he the the game against the pelicans bro it was like i don't it was like bro i don't even know how yeah like i said i don't even know how to explain like he had full control of that game and did whatever he wanted in all phases every part of the core offensively defensively he took like three charges in that game like bro Mm -hmm. that that was game was like listen bro i've been here so much y'all are just y'all not even on this level yet mentally not even just like physically like mentally y'all just not here yet bro like that that was a clinic that game was super fun to watch all of that on top of the fact he knocked down two threes and then say, you know what? I'm feeling myself. What about a, a heat check from the logo? Cash. My jaw dropped. My jaw dropped when he shot it. I was like, LeBron? Right. Is that Curry? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, four for four from three. We talked about it before. LeBron, this is a career year from three for him. He's a career 34.6% three point shooter. He's shooting 40.7% from three which is one or 0.1 percent higher than his 2012 miami season where he was like a people to this day think that may have been the greatest nba player ever that version of lebron in miami bro it's crazy he's bro. shooting better than that <laughs> How do i don't get what better in year 21 I don't know. I literally have in my notes here. It literally just says LeBron. What else can I say? Like genuinely, I don't. It, it's gonna sound like I'm writing like crazy, but like for real, what else can you say about it at this point? Now it's funny though because I seen a video. I was just scrolling. I seen a video, and the dude was like, "Bro, you know how like mentally taxing it has to be to be a, like a LeBron hater at this point? Like not even like a Jordan's a goat guy, not a Kobe's, but like just like a just pure LeBron hater." Bro, it has to be frustrating, bro. Because, like, bro, when you think it's going to stop, when you think it slows down, stuff like this happens. Like, bro, it just it's never going to end, bro. It's just – it's tough, bro. It's tough. It must be a very, very tough life to live. Yeah, and then not only has his athleticism not really diminished, like, you can see that the – the level of conditioning isn't the same, mm-hmm. which is I, it's fair, bro. It's 39. It's right. fair that he's not able to just rattle off 25 straight points like he did when he was like 20 against the Pistons mm-hmm. in the playoffs. But for the moments where he has to turn it on, he still can turn it on and do all the same things that young LeBron used to do and yeah. still getting above the rim. It is crazy to watch how he's – really maintain this level of consistency and like you said mentally is like they were talking about it on the broadcast that most players i think kevin McHale said it he was like by the time you've really figured the game out mentally you're usually right. too old to do anything about it but it's like we're watching a guy who came in and had such great iq from a young age and how that grew and developed and he's at a point now where he might genuinely be 
one of, if not the smartest basketball players we've ever seen play and still be like, can you even say he might still be relatively in the peak of his powers? Like yeah, it's crazy at 39, like <laughs> how is that possible? Bro, like you're, you're right about the conditioning thing, but if you're talking about and that, that's why it's perfect for in season tournament setting. If mm-hmm. you're just talking about, bro, you can get, you can have three day, two, three days of rest, one game, health completely healthy even right now there's not a lot of players i take over lebron in, in that scenario like obviously series you know right like injuries for the future all that's that, what I'm yeah. exactly one game healthy with rest th- i there might not be three players i take over lebron even you, right now you would be hard pressed there's not many guys in the league who are going to be giving you the type of stat lines that he has put up in this in season tournament alone. Mm-hmm. 38 and 5, 24, 4 and 11, 31, 11 and 8. Like he's putting up absurd stat lines. Yeah, so, bro. That's it's, crazy. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, the MVP for him for this in season tournament is well deserved. Um, I, I don't know where that's gonna. I don't know if it should even have an effect on legacy. People are gonna bring it up. That's not something I'm looking to get into. Um, but at the end of the day, you can see that the tournament meant something to these players. People, I mean, these guys are competitive anyways in their nature. They're not just going to want – like you add a little extra incentive to anything, they're going to try harder. Um, so for there to be a trophy, for you to get half a million dollars just to be in Vegas, like that's something worthwhile to play for. Um, but at the end of the day, shout out to the Pacers. Look, I'm happy for Tyrese. I think it's really helped get his name out there because I think their semifinal game was actually only their quarterfinal game was the second time they'd ever even been on national TV. <clears throat> it's crazy. That's wild. Um, so it's not a guy that's flying under the radar anymore. I don't think it should go as far as people getting into this. Oh, did the Kings trade the wrong point guard? Cause I think we're doing a disservice to that whole trade. Cause obviously I think both teams have gotten better <laughs> from it. To me, it's one of the better right now, like win-win deals. Everybody gets better. Multiple years from now, like, yeah, we can have that discussion about what Tyrese Halliburton really turns out to be when he hits that, you know, his full prime. But we've got a ways to get there. We don't need to try to project too far into the future. Um, But shout out to this young Pacers team, bro. They were scrappy. They fought with a lot of good teams to get to the championship game. They fall all the way to the very end in this game um, against the Lakers. But like we both said, they had no answer for Anthony Davis. They had no answer for LeBron. They had no answer for any type of physicality that they brought. Um, so shout out to Darvin Ham too, getting himself, um, you know, this is good experience, not just for guys like, or guys like on teams like the Pacers who don't have a ton of playoff experience. Right. It's good for Darvin Ham too. Well, obviously, obviously made the Western Conference Finals last year, but again, still only in his this is only his second season, right? As a coach, um, mm-hmm. like to continue to get that experience in these you know tough scenarios. Um, so very, very good all around. Kudos to Adam Silver. Give him a round of applause. End season tournament was phenomenal. He I'm cooked looking with that. forward. Right. I'm looking forward to it again next year. Um, between that and the playing. I'm loving it. I'm loving all the additions to to make some more meaningful games throughout the season. So they've been cooking. They've definitely been cooking. And I, I gotta apologize because that's like the first though, all these all this stuff you've been adding in. I, every time at first, at least me personally, I've been like, eh, I haven't been out, but I've been like, even when I heard in season tour, I'm like, nobody who gonna play hard? Like right. five hundred thousand, they they millionaires. Like, what what? That, that was this was gas. I'm not gonna lie. This in season tournament. Now it's like you, you got to do this every year. It's not even like, uh, oh, are we gonna bring this back type of thing? Like, no, nah, you got to do it every year. Right. Same thing, like you said with the playing. Like at first, I'm like, I get it for the COVID year to do it after. It's like, bro, eight teams. If you ain't make it, you ain't make it. But I mean, the games, those games are those playing games are lit, bro. So no, nah, Adam Silver is definitely doing his thing. Definitely, definitely. And with that, we're gonna go ahead and get right into our second edition of the power rankings. Now that the First ever NBA Cup has wrapped up. 
going to go ahead and get this all pulled up here. Um, gonna gonna have some visuals for y'all if you're watching on YouTube, so you can follow along a little bit easier because we had to bump it up to ten teams. We did mm-hmm. five the last time. I tried to do five. I was struggling way too hard to cut the list off at five, so we, we expanded it out to ten. Um, so let me get it all set up here. Uh, all should be able to see the list. We're going to go through, you know, number by number, starting with the 10 spot in our 2.0 power rankings. I'll go first. I have the Dallas Mavericks here. Um, I think I just saw the latest report that the Kyrie injury is not as serious as it may first have looked, which is very, very, I mean, he's lucky because it looked bad. Uh, Dwight mm-hmm. Powell, if we haven't seen it, like fell flat on his foot. It looked like it could have been very, very, very bad. Apparently, it's just a contusion, which is like incredibly lucky that it's just a bruise <laughs> and not broken bones somewhere in his foot. Um, so happy for that. They're sitting at 13 and 8 on the season. Um, you know, I Luca is playing at an MVP level. Um, I've really liked, again, like I've mentioned before, um, Derek Lively for this team. Uh, I think he fits great. Grant Williams' addition has been great as well. Tim Hardaway Jr. is one of the the front runners for Sixth Man of the Year because he can come off and be a flamethrower on any given night. Um, the, the team is well rounded. There's definitely significantly more well rounded than they were last year. Um, all teams I have in front of them, again, I think maybe just have some more signature wins. They've looked better than the Mavericks. They're a little bit more elite in some of the other categories, but. Hard to keep them out of the top 10 again, just with their current record, how well Luca is playing, um, and how well some of their new additions have fit so far. Yeah, 100%. That was the team I was flipping back and forth with like forever. I was like, is it going to be Kings or is it going to be Mavericks? I only lean the Ma- I mean, I only lean the Kings just because, um, I think De'Aaron Fox is playing great right now, and mm-hmm. I do like some of the, their most recent wins that they had a little bit better than the Mavericks. Um, well, like, as far as like caliber team that they've beaten. But to me, that was really the coin flip between the Mavericks and the Kings. But like I said, I ultimately let, um, ultimately picked the Kings because I do like the way De'Aaron Fox is playing. Like, obviously, this is a team that won a lot of games already last year. So it's not like they're just kind of brand new into this. Um, and, yeah, I, I still feel like they're one of these really good teams that can, you know, get hot. They could beat pretty much anybody, especially on nights that they're really going. Um, but to me, it was, it was kind of a coin flip between them or the Mavericks. Mm-hmm. I, I had it the same way. The Kings were my first team out. Um, you already know how I feel about De'Aaron Fox this year. So mm-hmm. I wanted to try to find a way to get him on, but I couldn't really justify putting him over the Mavericks. But again, either way, they're neck and neck with each other. Um, De'Aaron Fox is on a ridiculous tear to start this season. He's low-key, sneakily, like could be in MVP conversations just for how well he's been playing with the type of production he's been putting up so far this year. I got you. Um. Moving on then to our number nine teams. Both have the Pacers, um, which, look, I think somebody commented on our last one uh, saying that it was crazy that we didn't have them in the top five after how well they started. They have a glaring issue, as great and historic as their their offense is. They're sweet on defense. <laughs> defense is a problem. <laughs> like, they, give, they give it up on defense. So we got right. this, this two sides of the ball, man. We can't just only as much as it's nice to flashy the offense, the threes. You got to guard. <laughs> you got to play some defense. Right. So for them to be sitting at, you know, at, after the, the NBA Cup is over, they're sitting at 12 and 8. You know, obviously having some big wins in the the in season tournament over the Celtics and the Bucks. Um, they're obviously a very good team. They're a very fun team. We've talked about it a ton. They're one of the most fun teams in the NBA because of their offense. That defense is a problem. Their lack of interior presence is a problem. I don't know how they are going to address it. I know they, you know, rumors have started to come out that they're looking to pair some big two-way wing to play alongside Tyrese. They already drafted Jairus Walker. I wish that they would kind of like let him get some run because he's a big two-way wing that you could develop alongside Tyrese Halliburton. But I I get the thought process. You want to pair him up with a guy who 
know, could be a strong point of attack defender, could be another, you know, ISO scoring option to help maybe alleviate some of that pressure that the Lakers were putting on Tyrese Halliburton and basically trying to eliminate him from the game and kind of, you know, stifling this offense entirely. But yeah, it's hard to put them any higher with their defensive issues. Yeah, I'm not going to even drag it out in too much longer. Same exact thing. Like, because you would think the team that just beat, uh, I'm, why am I blanking? They beat the Celtics mm-hmm. and they also beat the Bucks to get in the NCAA tournament would be higher. But the main thing is like the defense. Like, I can't put them no higher with that that big lack of a or a big problem on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, they, they got to get that short, short up if they want to make a actual run deep in the playoffs. Otherwise, unfortunately, feel like if this the season ended today, they would probably be like a first round exit type of team. Mm-hmm. Like so they're the six seed right now. So they would play one of these playing teams. Like if they matched up against Miami or New York, I'm taking either of those teams honestly pretty comfortably. <clears throat> yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Moving on to the eight spot. I've got the Bucks. Um, and I'm gonna keep it brief, kind of similarly to the Pacers. They've got some defensive questions as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and that showed in their in season tournament game, um, uh, against the Pacers. Um, because down the stretch, like I said, Tyrese Halliburton was lighting them up. The Pacers were able to light them up. That was a high scoring game. Um, obviously, they're sitting with a better record than Indiana, they're at 15 and seven. The offense is not a problem. The offense looks great. Chris Middleton has looked great these last couple of games. He's starting to get more acclimated into being that third option role. He has his moments where he can go on some individual runs with some great shot making, um, which is good to see. He's only going to continue to get better. Uh, but they've got to figure out what they're doing on the defensive side of the ball uh, because they're they're not performing at the level that a championship team is. Uh, accustomed to performing on defense is I think typically the last, I don't know, I feel like 20 years of NBA champions, I may be butchering the stat, but they've been roughly around like the top five or top 10 in defensive rating. It's very rare that you have a team that's outside of, you know, the top echelon of the league in defense end up winning the finals ultimately. And the Bucks are not in that range right now. So they've got to figure out a way to shore that up uh, for me to put them any higher on this rankings. Yeah, I feel you. Um, for me, number eight is the Magic. Um, I do like what the Magic have going on. I love they obviously have a good record. Um, obviously, obviously, still a great defensive team. I like the duel between Paolo and Franz and all their other pieces that they also have, like playing well right now. The reason I have them a little bit lower is just because when I look at them compared to all these other teams I have above them, like power rankings for me is a combination of how well you're playing now and still just my just overall viewpoint of your team, especially come later into the season and come playoff time. It's still tough for me to to trust that. Maybe I just got to, like, see it, like, as far as, like, later into the season or, like, an actual, like, playoff run. But as far as just the way they're playing, no, they're absolutely playing great. Um, And it, for me, it was a flip between my seventh and my eighth spot that you'll probably see right here. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm it's pretty sure we probably have flipped. Exactly. <laughs> we uh, yeah, so I don't got to spend a bunch of time on it. But the Magic have been playing great. We talked about it a couple of episodes ago. Um. They're really cementing themselves. I think, honestly, earlier on than I thought they would to be where they're at. They're sitting at the two seed out east, um, you know, at, at 15 and seven. Um, they've kind of been beating up on some bad teams as of late. Two wins against the Wizards, one against the Pistons, um, yeah, one against the Hornets as well without LaMelo. Uh, but look, got to be the teams that are in front of you. Um, they continue to look great defensively. I hope that um, the Jalen Suggs injury. Um, isn't too, too bad. I think he's finally coming back um, and being like out for sure to now being like kind of a day-to-day guy. So hopefully he'll be back soon um, because their their defense is the different animal when he's on the floor. Um, so shout out to the Magic. Them being even this high on the power rankings is a testament to, to how well they've been this year. 100%. I, uh, I put the Bucks one slot ahead of them just because, like I said, power rankings to me is a combination of how well you're playing now and my overall viewpoint of your team, you know, what I see you guys doing moving forward. Obviously, the Bucks aren't playing, like you said, like that top, top team that we thought they were going to be coming into the season because mm-hmm. of the problems that they have defensively. 
But at the end of the day, if I'm really just looking at this Bucks team, you got Giannis, you got Dame. Like right. I can always, always just harp on the fact that they have Giannis and they have Dame, mm-hmm. and that's the reason I give them a the slight edge. But like you said, defensively, it is a problem. Like it's, mm-hmm. and we knew it coming into the season. We knew it was going to be a problem as far as just off of just pure roster construction. But I mean, I feel like it's even worse than we kind of thought. Um, yeah, but that's honestly, like I said, the main reason is because I can always just harp on the fact that they have literally one of the best players on the planet and then another top 75 player on their team. Yeah, I, I have it flipped for the, the same reason. Similarly, that I'm valuing the Magic's defense just a little bit higher. I mm-hmm. have real concerns about the Bucks defense. And even, I don't want to get too much into it, but like Adrian Griffin and the coaching, there's been some weird moments where, you know, Giannis has looked in, weird coming out of timeouts. He just sometimes looks like a deer in the headlights. Mm. Um, which I'll, again, he's this is his first time ever being a head coach, first so time coach. Yeah, I'm not gonna rush into it too crazy to give any like thoughts on if he's the guy or not. But again, these are all things that they need to to shore up as it gets later into you know February, March, and the playoffs are around the corner. Hundred percent. Moving on to the sixth spot, I have the defending champion Nuggets just outside of the top five. Damn. Um, Look, they've been on a little bit of a little bit of a slide. Um, they're now sitting at 14 and nine. They're on a three-game losing streak, five and five in their last 10. I say all of that to say, am I really worried about Denver or Jokic? Because he's also had a bit of a rough, rough stretch of games, mm-hmm. um, especially just from an efficiency perspective perspective. Um, his full counting stats, he's still putting up the numbers, but you know, 34% from the field, 28% from the field. That's not very Jokic-like. Am I concerned about him or the Nuggets in the long term? No. But, again, as of late, just been looking a little bit, eh, you know, not not the greatest um, or to the level that we know that this Nuggets team can perform. I think they lost to the, the Rockets over the weekend as well for the second time now. Um, so, Rockets seem to, to maybe have the, the Nuggets number this year. Maybe it's Shangun, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but they, they got baby uh, Jokic over there. All right. Uh, but yeah, really, that, that's the reason why I've slid them out. They, again, five and five in their last 10, a little three game loss streak. Not super concerning, but they're just teams that are a little bit hotter right now um, that are performing a little bit, you know, performing better on both sides of the court um, that I have, have ranked above them. Yeah, I, I definitely like your reasoning. Um, for me, my number six is obviously the Thunder. Um, I like the way the Thunder is playing. Obviously, they got some good wins in these past couple well, past couple days. But um, and obviously, just as far as the, the team, the way they're playing, the way their team is constructed, obviously with Chet coming in, filling in, being that missing piece right there. Shea still being a superstar, still having shooters on the wing, great, like good on defense. Um, the only reason I have them at six, a little bit low, is because if I'm just looking at the rest of my list. I just trust all these other teams a little bit more. That's the pure reason. You know what I mean? Like I said, mm-hmm. combination between how they're playing, how I view them, I just trust the teams ahead of them just a little bit more. But the way they're playing right now, obviously I've talked about it plenty of times in the pod. I think they're my second most watched team out of obviously behind the Lakers of anybody in the NBA. So I love the Thunder. But I just I do trust these other teams a little bit more. Yeah, that's completely fair. Completely fair. Let's get into the top five. At my five spot, I do have the Philadelphia 76ers, um, who I believe are on a little bit of a win streak. Let me pull their schedule up. I think they won, what, two or three? So yeah, two in a row, um, beat the Wizards and the Hawks, um, and previously lost to the Celtics and the Pelicans. Um, they are currently sitting at 14 and seven on the season, which is good enough to be the four seed out east. Um, six and four in their last 10. And Bede is still on an absolutely monster stretch, monster season that he's been. He's now up to 33.3 points a game, uh, continues to lead the, the NBA in, in scoring, um, which would, if he holds this up, I think would be the third year in a row that he's done that. To do it as a center is crazy, but to do it three years in a row as a center um, is even crazier. Um, he had the 50-point game against Washington as well. Um, with 13 rebounds, seven assists. Um, he's been a force defensively, um, which we always know he can anchor an elite defense. Um, so this Sixers team is playing very, very well. 
Um, again, the teams that I have in front of them, I think are either just a little bit hotter or again, just a little bit more complete on both sides of the ball. Um, but the Sixers, we're, we're reaching the point of power rankings where it's like you can fluctuate all of these names. And I'm like, I can't really argue with you. Like, if that's how you feel, that's how you feel. All these teams are at this point legitimate title contenders as we're getting into this like top five. Facts. My five team, my five spot, the Lakers. You know what I mean? I, you know, I got to have my Lakers up here. But I like the way we've been playing. Um, obviously, defensively, we've been playing really well. The main thing, too, we're getting healthier. That's the biggest thing. Like, we're getting some key guys back. We're actually, you know, being able to put together a full rotation. Um, it seems like we kind of figured out, you know, the rotations, the who's going to be in the closing lineup, who's going to play which type of minutes. Um, obviously, just won the in-season tournament. Like, we don't need to keep talking about that. But the reason why I have them lower than, obviously, the Sixers is because, one, the Sixers beat the – breaks off of us that one came yep. <laughs> and two um we need to we need to play this good in non-in-season tournament games like can we <laughs> get like we when it's in-season tournament we literally literally do not lose but like these other games like kind of slacking a little bit still playing well i still feel like we're playing good but i just need to have us carry this momentum from this in-season tournament win on to the rest of the season and then obviously i'll bring i'll bring them up higher after that but they're my five spot that's fair. You better than me because <laughs> I put them. I put them ahead of the 76ers. Like you said, completely fair. 76ers did beat the brakes off. The <laughs> but I'm not gonna talk about it a ton because we did just harp on it. But what I saw from this Lakers team, specifically in this in season tournament, gave me a lot, a lot of optimism about what this team could look like, the potential of what they could look like come playoff time. Um, and when I think about how they looked in this in-season tournament compared to the Western Conference Finals last year. There's some legitimate improvements mm -hmm. that were, were made um, on, on both sides of the ball and still got guys who are hurt, particularly Gabe, Gabe Vincent, who come back and get into that fold and even provide. You mean Kendrick Nunn? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's Sick crazy it. how he's pulling the exact same <laughs> like <setup>. same <laughs> thing like bro we can't win bro it's always somebody uh but but he could could potentially come in and be a guy who um could add and, and boost offensively and defensively like we know he was mm -hmm. able to do for the heat last year um but if that version of anthony davis that we saw in the championship game can play relatively consistently in the playoffs, and he had a great playoffs and postseason last year. I feel like that version of AD with this version of LeBron, with this currently constructed Lakers roster, which I feel like is a decent step better than they were last year, is a very dangerous team out West. Very dangerous team out West. Would I take them over Denver in a seven-game series? I don't know, but it's definitely closer than it, it was – thinking about it at the start of the season. We're not going to get swept, hopefully. Definitely man. not going to get swept. We're not going to get swept. We might win one, you know. Don't t listen, Billy. Put Never mind. Switch mind. Put the Lakers at one, bro. You just yeah. talked me into it. Put them <laughs> at one, bro. But nah, man, it's just, yeah, that, that's the main thing. Being able to, uh, like I said, build off of this win. Because I agree with you. Like, just if we just talk about how we looked in the in-season tournament, we looked great. Like, mm -hmm. we looked fantastic. Um, I just – hope that we can put together that type of performance moving forward and then especially come playoff time. Um, so that's really my, my main concern. I think we can, but I just definitely just want to see it a little bit more. Um, mm. And that's the only main, like I said, that's one of the main reason I have them behind the Sixers because to me, another team could just easily just flip. Like right. I said, it does pay me that they absolutely beat the brakes off of us. They but, did. <laughs> yeah. That, that's the reason why I have them at four and Lakers at five. Yeah. Moving into the top three. At the three spot is where I have the Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, like you mentioned earlier, very fun team to watch. They're now sitting at 14 and seven on the season, um, which is good for the two seed in the West. This young team is playing phenomenally. They're seven and three in their last 10. Um, they've got a bunch of marquee wins on the season. Um, beat the Warriors most recently. Um, they've played the Timberwolves very close recently. Um, like Shea Gilgis Alexander is going to probably be first team all NBA again. 
He's one of the best guards in the the NBA, one of the best scorers in the NBA, um, one of the most unique players. Chet, like we've talked about, has come in and given you the offensive and defensive impact. Jalen Williams is fits so well with this team. Lou Dort still putting people in the torture chamber. Uh, this Thunder <laughs> team is a, a tough a tough game night in night out for anyone East or Western Conference, um, and they have the record to prove it. They have the tough ones to to show it, um, and they feel very 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 well constructed. And I would not be surprised if they look to package up some of these picks that they're sitting on and boost it even further and make a little bit of a splash trade because I think the time is right. Clearly, as currently constructed, they can compete. Mm -hmm. But why why be good when you can be great? And I think it's time that they, you know, take those whatever 30 plus (laughs) first round picks. I don't know how many it really is, but the ridiculous amount of first round picks that they have over the next five, six years. Man, throw like four or five of them in a, a trade package that no one can compete with and go get somebody. Bring Might them on well. this team. And, bro, this is a, a very, very legitimate team out west. Hard to say that they'll be a full title contender just because of their age. It's hard for a young team to be that legit. But they're going to be tough. They're going to be scrappy. Um, they're just going to be a hard team to beat come playoff time. 100%, man. I, I like doing these power rankings because you can clearly see the – like, I think you're valuing more of, like, who, how you're playing now versus, like, I'm taking into account, like – we're both looking at it from a stamp, the same standpoint, like, how you're playing right. plus, you know, what you view of the team. But, like, clearly me with the Nuggets still just, <laughs> just putting them at three is, like, and listen. I can't fault it. Like, the Nuggets are Not. still the Nuggets, bro. <laughs> exactly. And same with your list because it's, like, I see both sides of it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, right now they're on a little bit of, like, a – a, a, a skit you know what i mean but just the reason why i have them at three is because like i said because it's the nuggets and because of the 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 way they're losing the fact that Jokic isn't being efficient right now isn't playing well as far as Jokic standards mm-hmm. i don't care like i he will be perfectly fine i know and you said the same thing like he will be fine you know what i mean so i still have them at three because i still feel like like you even brought it up with the lakers if they played a seven game series right now would you take the lakers over the nuggets probably not and even as a Lakers fan, I probably wouldn't either just because right. they're the Nuggets. So I'm going to still give them a, a, a little bit more respect. Um, obviously, if, if it continues, then obviously I'm going to slide them down a little bit longer or a little bit further down. But for now, I'll leave them at the three spot. Definitely. Getting into the top two, I, we got the same two. I don't know if they're in the same order. Nope. They are not. And again, really for these two, I struggled to flip them back and forth. Same. Ultimately, I did settle with the Timberwolves one and the Celtics two. Uh, but 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 talk about the Timberwolves first and why why you have them at the two spot. The Timberwolves, I have them at the two spot just because compared to the Celtics, it's say uh, to me every time I struggle with two teams, I just look at it from a standpoint of like, would I take them? Who would I take in like a seven game series? Who would I who would I take more seriously? Don't get me wrong. You have to take the Timberwolves seriously. Like, they are a legit team. That defense is legit. Rudy Gobert is, you know, you know how I feel about Rudy Gobert, but he's playing excellent right now. He's playing great. Anthony Edwards is that breakout superstar that we were talking about. So just as far as and, – and they have the key wins, too. Like, they're beating the good mm-hmm. teams. They have the key wins. I'm pretty sure they have, probably have the best record in the league. I didn't even – I don't think – I don't have it pulled up in front of me. I'm pretty sure they do. Both um, these teams are the one seed east and west. Okay, yeah. Makes sense. So – yeah, like they're they're a super legit team, but at the end of the day, I just personally just like the Celtics just because obviously, like I said, two best records in the league. Um, obviously, both have superstars. Both have like we still are a little questionable about the cat thing, but like as far as just the roster construction everywhere else, I do like it. Um, the Celtics obviously I like a little bit more. Um, and I just it always goes back to the versatility from the Celtics. I just love the fact that, like, bro, t- obviously you got Tatum, you got JB, you got Przingis, but then Derek White can come out of nowhere and give you 30. You got freaking Drew Holiday still there. It's, it feels like people don't even talk about Drew Holiday because right. of how many good players they have on that team. So just at the end of the day, it's just personally hard for me to put someone over the Celtics, but there's 100% a reason why you can have the Timberwolves over the Celtics. Mm-hmm. Part of what I think 
did it for me was a the Timberwolves have like the Celtics have too. Like obviously the Celtics have been dealing with the Chris Stapps injury. Um, but the Timberwolves have been dealing with some injuries. Ant missed a couple of games. JD McDaniels, I don't think has played in a couple of weeks. Uh, I think he rolled his ankle. Um, I think he's a, even a game time decision for their game later today, but yeah, he hasn't played since November 20th. Um, so they've dealt with a couple of injuries, but on, you know, despite that they've stayed the course. We talked about it in our award episode. Rudy Gobert, I think, is the clear defensive player of the year winner. Um, again, his his impact and deterring people at the rim, being on a team with the defenders that this this Timberwolves roster has. Um, like I said, both these teams have marquee wins. You I, you could argue it either way. It's like splitting hairs at that point to pick one and two. If they match up in a seven game series right now, both healthy. A, I think it'd be a great series, but I would probably take the Celtics. Um, but as they've been playing, you know, trying again, we kind of called it out like my list. I'm trying to take a little bit more into account of like the now and not trying to, you know, put my 100% full listing on like how I feel about these teams in the playoffs. Um, the Timberwolves, I think, are nine and one in their last 10. They're on a six game win streak. Again, not necessarily against the greatest competition, but. You play who's in front of you. You beat the bad teams that are in front of you. That's what good teams should do. Um, but, again, marquee wins. Um, they look great. Anthony Edwards looks phenomenal. Rudy Gobert looks phenomenal. Hopefully, Jay McDaniels comes back. Um, but, yeah, that, that's why I give them the, the slight edge over the Celtics. They're a little bit hotter right now. But Celtics are the Celtics. And I, it's hard. It, it was hard <laughs> to rank it this way. But. So I ultimately landed on. Yeah, and that's the good thing about power rankings. Power rankings are going to fluctuate, bro. There, there, there shouldn't be, I mean, obviously, unless you have, like, the Wizards at four or something, like, there's there's no right way to do a power rankings. You know right. what I mean? Because, like, it, have, it really depends on your balance between how do you feel about the team and how they're playing right now. Because, like you said, mm -hmm. a lot of teams you have higher on your list than I do are probably pl are definitely playing better than some of the teams that I have a little bit higher than them. So, but, yeah, I, I like both the lists, to be honest. Yeah, it, I mean, it's the only team that's not on both lists is just the Mavericks and the Kings. Everybody else is just in some mismatch yeah. order, one through nine. It's mm -hmm. uh, so like you said, it, there's no oddballs up here. There's no Wizards. No, should have put <laughs> one to throw you off. Should be like the three spot the Wizards. You'd be like, and I'd have made my case too, and you'd have just been like, all right, cool. <laughs> um, the only team I I think is interesting. Not interesting. It's tough, but like Phoenix, it's tough. Yo, I Bradley was looking Bill's at coming Phoenix. back soon, though. Yeah, I'm, I was looking at Phoenix, but I'm like, bro, I don't, I don't know if I could want them up here. Like that was just my thought process when I was doing this. I'm like, I don't really think they slot anywhere up here, at least right. yet for me. You know, definitely if you're viewing it just as like how teams have played this season, not trying to look into what they could be come playoff time or if they really mm -hmm. have a chance at you know pushing for a title. Like, or a seven seed out west, they would be in the plane if the playoffs started today, right? So, do you think that's the biggest team that I like? If we just had to predict kind of how it would shake out, like the next time we do this, is that probably the one team you see that would probably slot in here? Not like, not as like a nine, ten, because that like anybody could do that, but like mm -hmm. six, five, maybe. Like, is that the team with the highest probability of that? I think they have a good chance at it especially if Bradley Beal is finally trending to get on the court. Um, but the one that I think is a little bit even sneakier that I think will could potentially be solidly in the top 10 the next time we do this come January is the Clippers. Mm, okay. The Clippers are – they're looking a little bit more cohesive – Ty Lue did say, give them 10 games. You know, now they're, I think they're on a little three game win streak. They had the win over the Nuggets as well with the win over the Warriors. They also, I beat the Kings recently and the Mavericks. So it's like, you know, they got some solid wins under their belt. Um, I think they're seven and three in their last 10. Um, the fits are looking a little bit better um, than they were when, you know, this all started. Um, so I, I think they're starting to get a little bit more comfortable. So I feel like the Clippers are a team that we could see sneak into here um, when we do this the next time. 
because uh, if they continue to rattle off wins at the rate that they are, they'll continue to climb the standings out west. Obviously, they'll probably have to have a couple more of those wins against big teams, which will come. Um, but really, it's the the comfortability that which which their offense plays at, um, which I think will be the the key factor to how I view this team strictly for a power rankings perspective. Because in seven game series with their talent, like they're always gonna have a shot. Facts. It's interesting. Definitely gonna be interesting seeing how this list looks uh, moving forward. That's that's why we always got to keep track of like where it's at to see how it yeah. fluctuates, see who goes All up, right. see who goes down. Now we got it set. So next time we do this, I'm gonna have a little arrows for who went up. Who oh went yeah, down. That's gonna be fire. <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be fire. But that's gonna do it for our 2.0 edition of the power rankings. We'll do a next one in January. That'll be 3.0, and we'll keep it going all the way until. The final edition right before the playoffs. Um, let me get it back to the other layout real quick. Um, with that, I don't. I wasn't planning on necessarily doing a full NFL segment. Try to keep <laughs> the, try to keep the time down. Uh, you know, a little bit closer to an hour and some change instead of two hours and some change, but. How can I not talk about the Dallas Cowboys, man? Uh, let me sit back. Go ahead, Billy. Take over. That's all you, my guy. The first thing I'll say, and I, I say it all the time, uh, and I like to hold myself accountable to it. I always say that I'll, you know, if, if I say something and somebody does something to, to change my mind or I made a prediction and it was way off, I'll be the first person to say I was wrong. I came in early in this season, and I said, you know what? Mike McCarthy said all this about being a play caller, blah, blah, blah. I wasn't feeling it. The play calling didn't look good. It looked very JV-ish. The last, let's let's say since what, like week seven? That's the buy. Right, yeah. It's a different different looking offense from output, different looking offense from play calling as well. So I'll be the first one to say I was wrong. Mike McCarthy, I'm a believer. I see it. <laughs> I got it. Whatever you and Dak sorted out, like you said, in that bye week, he's much more comfortable. He's taking command of the offense. He's I, The amount of checks he's making at the line, like he just feels like he's so in control of what's going on now. And it's not a bunch of – like you mentioned on the broadcast all the time, this West Coast offense, you know, you get to your third step, you get to your hitch and the ball is out, whatever. It felt like before that was it. Like you get to that that spot and we throw in these dump offs, you know. Mm-hmm. Now it feels like he gets to the spot. If it's not there and in rhythm, he's extending the plays. Some of these quick game, even it feels kind of like quick game, but they're shot plays. Like the the big throw down the, uh, the sideline to gallop towards the end of the game. I think it was late in the third quarter. Mm-hmm. He has that's the hot throw. He has a free runner in his face, but he's taking the fade ball down the sideline. So that level of comfortability in the play calling and for Dak to be executing at the level that he is at. I gotta give my props to Mike, Mike McCarthy because I was not a believer at first. I'm changing my tune now. Yeah. The media talk around the Cowboys has been. Oh, well, they beat up on all the bad teams. They played the Eagles the first time and lost. They played the 49ers and got whooped. They got to beat a good team. And I agree. You have to eventually beat the good teams on your schedule if you want me to believe that you can beat good teams come the playoffs because that's who you're going to be playing. So they needed to get this game against Philly because they have a good little stretch here to end the season. Obviously now having to go to Buffalo, to Miami, then play Detroit. Before they wrap up the season with the commander. So three more very formidable opponents coming up. This was their first test. I guess you can count Seattle. I'm not super high on Seattle. That win didn't impress me that much aside from Dak's performance, but these games against uh, Philly and the ones coming up, I needed to see wins here. So to come out on Sunday night football and beat the Eagles by 20, in the fashion that they did, the Eagles' offense didn't score a touchdown. Nope. Jalen Hurts looked rattled by the second half of this game. Stephon Gilmore, 
I don't even know. Like he, ever since they switched him on to DK last week, he's been playing pretty good all year. He like turned it up to another level. Mm-hmm. It seemed like he he took it personally to the matchup against DK last week, and he came in and took his matchup with AJ Brown personally this week and defended him about as well as anybody has defended AJ Brown all year. Um, he had one of the forced fumbles in that game as well. So Stephon Gilmore played phenomenally. The whole defense as a unit played incredible all night long. Um, they kept the run game pretty much bottled up aside from some early runs from Hertz. Um, and then again, they consistently were able to get pressure on Hertz, which kept him, you know, not comfortable throughout most of the game. Uh, a lot of blitzes that came through pretty cleanly with some free runners. They got some hits on Hertz. Some of them were pretty big. Um, so like I said, by the end of the game, he just did not look comfortable, um, was missing some throws that you kind of would anticipate him to be able to make. But this Cowboys team, like I said, I, I try to keep the optimism low. <laughs> it's going up. <laughs> it's going up. Um, look, Dak Prescott is – I've for the longest have said that he's he's a guy that they had to pay because he's a franchise quarterback, but I think he will forever be on the outside looking in of that elite tier of quarterbacks. I'm not going to say that he is in that tier with some of those guys, but if we're just looking, if we cut out everything else and we just look at this season, there aren't many guys, if any guys, playing the quarterback position better than him right now. So for just this season alone, he is playing at an elite level. Um, Third in the NFL in yards, first in touchdowns. I think he now leads the NFL in uh, touchdown to interception ratio, which was a big reason why I was super high on C.J. Stroud when we did our midseason awards. Um, He's second in QBR, I think, only to Brock Purdy. And I also will add, I think he has a significantly larger uh, weight to carry when it comes to offensive production than Brock Purdy. Not even close. Uh, right. Not even necessarily because of a difference in talent levels in the uh, in the weapons that he has, but just the ways. Scheme. Right. Like, right. It's more air yards. A lot of the, the stuff that, that Purdy does sometimes is, like you said, schemed up. It's married up with the run game. Um, the one thing I will say about Mike McCarthy, he did say that he wanted to run the ball more. He, he still be abandoning the run a lot, mm. but look, I'm not going to sit up here and just complain to complain because it's working. Like I said, this was a huge, huge one for this Cowboys team on Sunday night football. Dak Prescott, I think barring like an absolute collapse over these next couple of games, I think is going to be the MVP of the NFL, which is crazy to think about. I don't think I would have ever considered a year where Dak would be the MVP. But here we are, um, and I can't wait to hear the media narratives around it, bro. I can't wait because it's going to be annoying, but s- some people are going to have to suck it up and sing his praises because he has been playing unbelievably this season. And I remember when we posted, right, we did a little prize picks over under Dak interceptions, and I think their line was – his line was set at like 12 or 13. Yeah. And dudes in the comments like, he going to clear that easy. He He's clear for, that. Throwing for oh. 15, throwing for 17. He might not hit double-digit interceptions. He could throw a pick every single one of these last four games and just get to 10. Yeah. But and people that and people was getting on us. was like, of course, that's going to throw 10. What you mean? Of course. He's gonna... Yeah. Okay, bro. Listen, the takes, even if it takes you some time, it's going to be right at the end. But the takes normally are right at the end. But, um, but yeah. No, it's a. I, I agree with everything you said. You know, the Cowboys are playing very well. Um, Dak Prescott specifically, look, man, I, I can't say he's elite because elite quarterbacks do the same thing in the playoffs. Elite quarterbacks, mm-hmm. you know, show them in the playoffs. But right now, if we're just talking about like just right now, right. bro, listen, I'm not going to sit here and act like I'm just a QB whisperer. I know everything about quarterbacks. But as someone who used to play quarterback, bro, he's – playing like the best quarterback in the league, bro. Like, it's just the throws he's making. Like I said, the control of the offense, um, like the checks at the line, just the trust that they have in him, too, in order to even throw that pass to Gallup 
Um, mm-hmm. I believe it was. I don't know if it was third and one or second and one. I forgot exactly what it was. Third and one. Was third and one. Exactly. Play. Bro, third and one. Normally, with that, with the old narrative of Dak Prescott, you're not trusting him to throw no deep shot down the field. He's gonna throw a pick. Bro, he has complete command of the offense. He the throws he's making are dots. Every single one of them are are dots on the money. Perfect throws. Like he's. I don't know what they did with this whole system. I don't know what level. Because um, cause they were talking about on the broadcast, they were like, Dak Prescott was talking to him. They were just like, oh, yeah. It's like he figured out how to play quarterback, like, yeah. which was like, which is weird to think of the guy in like his what, eighth season just, just now. Like, all right, it's clicking. But that's what it looks like. Like, he does not look like the same player. Even the Dak that was putting up crazy numbers, he still doesn't even look like that guy. Like, it looks like a whole new player. So he's playing great. To me, it was like this before this game, but he was easily my MVP because the whole – to me personally, I don't think Brock Purdy is the most valuable player on his offense. <laughs> yeah. Let alone the league. Like the first mm-hmm. play of the game was a 72 yard run by Christian McCaffrey. So, like, I'm not trying to knock Brock Purdy like he's not good. Brock Purdy is a really good quarterback. Mm-hmm. I think they can win the Super Bowl with Brock Purdy. So, like, two things can be true at once. Right. But as far as the MVP, most valuable player in the league, is Dak Prescott to me. It's, it's, it's literally, to me, it's not close. Like, I just think, like you said, the, the, the responsibility he has, the way they're playing, even just off the way their offense are offenses are constructed. My uh San Francisco's run heavy, they're run first, like they look great when the run game is going. The Cowboys are like, bro, no, we're throwing the ball, bro. We could be up by a lot of points. We are spreading it out and we're throwing the ball and it's working. So to me, Cowboys are playing really good. Dak Prescott is the MVP of the league. But again, you do have to see it come playoff time. So I'm actually really excited for that. Yeah, but this this one was huge. It gets us even in terms of record with the Eagles. I think they still sit, or I guess technically now we've taken over the lead of the NFC East, but if the Eagles win out, um, they will still end up winning the division. Um, but they what if still you have... guys went out? If you guys went out, you guys can't um, win it? Or... Mm-hmm. I don't think Damn. so. I don't really understand what the tiebreaker is there, but that's what they were saying on the, the broadcast. Damn. Um, but the Eagles do at least have one somewhat hard game left to play. They got to go and play Seattle. (laughs) Maybe Geno's back, but Drew Locke didn't look too bad against the the Niners this week. So I don't know. This Eagles defense is questionable. Their offense. (laughs) They're not questionable though. We know, we know they're, they're bad. That's a bad defense, bro. Like, if they're, if they're where they weren't the Eagles, like you put this defense, these stats on any other team, bro. The defense is bad. It's not good. Yeah. And it's funny because we got up here after week one uh of the season and we're like, I don't know, bro. Matt Jones almost led this led the Patriots to a comeback. The yeah. secondary is questionable. And now <laughs> Look at that Patriots team. You're telling me they almost <laughs> beat y'all? Oh, it was no. laying y'all up, too. It was laying y'all ass up, which is crazy. Uh, so, yeah, this defense is – their secondary. Obviously, they're dealing with some injuries. Reed Blankenship got hurt in that game last night, which is tough. Like, he's going to be in concussion protocol. Um, But, look, their defense is playing – poorly to the point where their offense literally cannot have a all it, not even the off night they can't have multiple off drives mm-hmm. like if they're not producing at a relatively high clip they're going to lose and that is a it's a big big problem mm-hmm. um because you're not going to be able to get back to the super bowl with the defense like this because also like at the same time this offense ain't that prolific right now either. They're not just out here lighting the world on fire. It's it's tough because it's like, like if you look at the recipe from last year, right? If you really look at how they did last year, it was like obviously great defense, and it was we're gonna run the ball, run the ball, run the ball. The running game is gonna open up the passing game. Now it's like you get all defenses are giving up so many points. So sometimes you gotta just as flat out abandon the run game mm-hmm. to where you're just strictly passing. If it's just like, don't get me wrong, I, I still think, like, because people are, there's a lot of narratives going around about Jalen Hurts. I still think Jalen Hurts is elite. So, but I also don't think he's, he's like a, that's just not him to spread it out, you know, pass every right. single play. That's just not their scheme. That's not how they're supposed to win. 
Before you go any further, I do got to say, David Carr, that was one of the dumbest things I've ever <laughs> seen, read. To sit up here and say, like, he sh if he wanted to just stop and be like, oh, maybe the Eagles should bench Jalen Hurts to let him get healthy for the playoffs because they're going to be a playoff team regardless of whether they lock up the one seed or not. Okay. I don't know. Like, the kind of you kind of may be putting your chances at getting the one seed in danger. Mm -hmm. which is definitely valuable to get that bye week. But I get the line of thinking to take it a step further and be like, oh, no, nah, they should bench him to let him get healthy. And because in games, like you said, when they get behind and they need to pass the ball a lot, I don't think he can read defenses like that. Let's put Mariota in there. Marcus Mariota. It, it, Marcus Mariota in the year of our Lord, 2023, is about to come in here and you're telling me he's going to just dissect the NFL defense? Did you watch? Did like? Did you, you watch the Falcons last year? Right. You even got to watch the Falcons. Go watch quarterback on Netflix. What bro, happened? Facts, at the, facts. He left the team, bro. <laughs> Come on, bro. Like y'all just out here engaging for clicks, and it is stupid. I, I had to get that off because I was gonna, I was gonna forget it if I didn't. But yeah, they that was insane, bro. Marcus Mario. Every time I think of that, I think of the one play against the Panthers where the dude is falling down. On the ground, closes his eyes and just throws it 360. And I'm like, bro, this is not NFL quarterback play. It's just not. There's no, no. way this guy is a starter. There's no way. Oh. But yeah, I I am impressed. This win for the Cowboys was much, much needed for me to feel comfortable about how they'll look in the playoffs. For me to feel comfortable how Dak will look in the playoffs. And I know it's got to be a big confidence boost for them in the locker room. Because as oh, much yeah. as you try to block it out, like, you hear it. And it's a it's a fair argument. Like, I can't complain. I was one that was echoing it. Like, great, we beat up on bad teams. That's what good teams should, should do. Good teams also have to beat other good teams. You're not going to get them all, but you got to get some. Mm -hmm. um, so this was the third – Good team again. I'm not putting so much weight on that Seahawks game because I'm not a huge believer in them. Uh, but this is the third good opponent that you've played this year. So to not only go out and win, but to really dominate the game from start to finish, it got a little bit dicey there in the third quarter with the strip sack fumble. But again, the offense came back and responded. The defense continued to play lights out. Um, so to go out, get a 20 point win against a division rival, um, I'm very, very excited to see this Bills game uh, this weekend because uh, as tough as this little stretch of games is here, none of them are – all of them are very winnable. And I don't know, Eagles just got to slip up one time us to mess around, win the, win the division. Who knows? Could, the Cowboys are still very, very alive for the one seed. They got the hardest schedule out of all the teams that are in contention for it, but uh, – look. You all you can hope for is the opportunity to be able to get it, and so mm -hmm. they've put themselves there. Yeah, hundred percent. So I mean, we'll see. It's gonna be interesting. Definitely gonna be an interesting little stretch. Definitely. I'm so uh, glad y'all won. I just wanted y'all to shake stuff up in the in the in the NFC East. I just want just like chaos. It's fun. No, yeah. Look, as, if I wasn't a Cowboys fan, I would have wanted it too, just so that it can be like, ooh, <clears throat> now the one seed is really up for grabs. Because exactly, if you lose and it's like you look at the Eagles' schedule, it's like, bro, they could sleepwalk potentially to it with having that one game cushion. Without the one game cushion, it's a little, it's a little sketch. It's Every little game sketch. matters, right? Um, I can't let us go to NBA trivia without talking about the. Bills Chiefs game and how that all ended. Um, for those of you all that haven't seen it, uh, Buffalo beat Kansas City 20 17 on what some people are calling a controversial flag there at the end of the game for offensive <sighs> offsides. I'm going to come out and say it right now Patrick Mahomes, Andy Reid, the whole Chiefs organization, bro, y'all tripping. Y'all are tripping. This man was egregiously offsides. Like, it wasn't even, like, a ticky-tack, like, ah, dang, we split hairs here. Like, bro, his helmet and foot might have been in front of the ball. Fact. Like, he's in the neutral zone. He's not even allowed to be remotely that close. Like, bro. what are we talking about here? 
And the whole, what really is, and I, bro, I love Patrick Mahomes, but I'm always shoot it straight. For him to go into that post game handshake with Josh Allen and be talking about some, what a fucking stupid call, like offensive offsides. Can't believe they fucking called that. Like, bro, just say good game and walk away. If I was Josh Allen, like, he better man than me. I'd have been like, cry more. <laughs> like, I'd have been like, talking bro. crazy. Like, bro. Man, what you coming to me saying that for? Like, I'm the opposing team. Like, what? Like, right. bro, when they when Josh Allen lost to him in the playoffs before <laughs> they changed the overtime rules, he ain't go there and, and do all that in your face after the game. Lucky I ain't had a ball. Like, we, like he ain't right. weak like that. Like, he he didn't complain about the rules when it didn't benefit him. So why are you doing it right now? Like, obviously he's frustrated in the heat of the moment and all that, but like, I don't know, bro. That seemed just. That's just corny to me, to be honest. Like, yeah. like I said, Josh Allen better than me because I would have said something. There's no way you about to, bro. All you got to do is walk up, dap me up, and say good game, stay healthy, and walk away. Yeah, man. It's just it, that was that was a bad look because what do you want the refs to do? Like, what do you want the refs to do? Not call that, like, bro. And, and it's it's tough, bro, because like y'all are the Chiefs, and don't get me wrong, like I've never like. I like the Chiefs, and I've never been the type to be like, yeah, they get lucky because of this call, they get lucky because of that call. But, like, if we're being honest, there's been a lot of, like, ticky-tacky, like, eh, could go 50-50 calls late in big games, big play. The biggest games, of games. The biggest game. <laughs> right. Come on now. on their way. So, like, you can't – you like, you guys are not the one to complain like that. I, you right. just can't. I'm sorry. But Of all the instances that it's happened and you have been the – on the benefiting side, bro, you got all these other quarterbacks, all these other players that have come out and just been like, look, I, I'm never going to just sit here and let a, a, a single call from a, a ref dictate the game. But you're going to come out and on the field in y'all post-game interviews, everybody just whining and complaining about this one call, and it was the right call. Like, it's it was, not no, – there's no questions about it, bro. It wasn't Tiki tag It was the right call. And, like, bro – I understand you can't get on Tony right then and there, but like, bro, why the hell is he lined up? Like, bro, this, yo, know, listen, somebody paid him off, bro, because this whole season he's been doing stuff that's like, bro, are you, do you, are you trying to make them lose? Like, it's not like, bro, you're having a bad play, you made a mistake. Like, bro, he's doing stuff that looks like he's actively trying to make them not win games, bro. Right. It is ridiculous. It's been all season, but yeah, bro, it's like, Stuff doesn't count. Come down to that. Stuff doesn't come down to one play. Like I get it; it's frustrating, but like it doesn't come down to one play, bro. And especially for you guys who got away with a lot of those ticky tack calls, you you just can't be the one to complain in that moment. But I mean, I don't know, man. Just play, play better <laughs> throughout the game until you're not in that situation, bro. I don't know what to tell you. Like just play better. And granted, he is he. I think before he was. Um, I think I forgot what game it was he did say like all right look i'm not looking for calls late in the game like i'm not looking to calls that benefit me but still you just you can't put yourself in that situation where you gotta just play better throughout the game right and again y'all are this is happening what they were on the the buffalo 49 so you're basically yeah. you're right at midfield it is second and 10 when this offensive all sides happen yeah, it's tough because it's a crazy looking play. Obviously, like a crazy play from Kelsey to even attempt that. Like, my heart would have dropped if I was Andy Reid. Like, I would have went from like, "Oh my gosh, what are you doing?" to "Oh my gosh, you're crazy." But at the end of the day, like, yeah, you're frustrated in the heat of the moment about the call. You don't have the wherewithal to stop and think about if it's the right call. You're not looking for the replays or whatever. You get the it's second and fifteen, <laughs> like basically still out of field. Mm -hmm. You just need to get in the field. You don't need a touchdown. You just need to get in the field goal range. You have timeouts. Second and 15, Patrick Mahomes pass incomplete. Third and 15, Patrick Mahomes pass incomplete. Timeout, timeout. Fourth and 15, Patrick Mahomes pass incomplete. You had three more shots at it. So we not, why are we going to blame it on the call? It was three more downs of football to be played, bro. Yeah. And it's not like you needed to get some Hail Mary 15 yards. I'm not hearing it, bro. So I really thought it was – that was – from a guy, like I said, I, I love watching Patrick Mahomes play. I think he's the most talented quarterback we've ever seen. That was lame, bro. 
the way that this whole situation went about after the game, what he was saying, um, like I said, on the field and in his post-game press conference, that's lame. Like like you said, they've been on the receiving end of a lot of questionable, you know, ticky-tack calls that have gone their way, and people have not come out on the other side of the organization. They're asking Jalen Hurts about it right after he just lost the Super Bowl in a game where he played better than Patrick Mahomes. And he's like, I just – it's not going to decide the game. Refs don't decide the game. But you up here going crazy about offensive offsides, talking about it's, a, it's hurting Travis Kelsey's Hall of Fame legacy. Like, what are we talking about, bro? And it's like, it's crazy because you guys are, and like, you admit that it's not a, the wrong call. You're just mad that they called it, like, in the moment. Like, you know it's the right, like, you can see it. He's above the ball. Like, right. I don't know. It, that, it, it, it was a bad look. Don't get me wrong. It definitely was a bad look. I, I do – if you're giving him any benefit of the doubt, it's just like here the moment he's just pissed off, but you just can't do that, bro. You got to keep the composure. I think all, right. he, th th all that was probably like built up from the actual receivers. Like he probably really wanted to do that to Tony, but like you can't blast your guy on national TV like that. So I don't know, man. It's tough. Tough. Get better. <laughs> it's like, get better. Tell your, team, tell your receivers, catch the ball. Tell, tell you guys, get better, bro. That's Pop right. Warner, bro. You don't know to look at the ref line up. Like, like, that's Pop Warner stuff, bro. And people are trying to figure out if he did that or not. But it's like, I'm going to be honest with you. I feel pretty comfortable in saying that he didn't. Because if he would have checked with the ref and the ref would have been like, yeah, you're good. And that's where he's – no way. No way the ref is saying that, bro. I, I will say the only – because I don't know if you remember – I don't even remember if it was this season or last year. No, it was last year. You were talking about Terry McLaurin when the yeah. did that. That was crazy. I would, I would be mad. All right, don't get me wrong. If that happened, then when the, with the Terry one, I would have flipped out, bro. Because Terry looked, I think he looked like twice. He was like, he did I'm good. He giving I'm him good. the thumbs up. He's like good. Yeah, and then th that's crazy. Don't get me wrong. That one, I would have lost my mind. I would have completely agreed with everything he did, except the Josh Allen thing. Like, I don't care what happens to do it. Say it to Josh Allen, I think that's just wrong. But <laughs> yeah, I. <laughs> I'd agree with it, but like, bro, Tony, Tony's it's, not even. I there's doubt no he way he don't even, bro. You don't even gotta look at the ref. Look at, look at yours. Look at the ball. You can't be like, dang, it's a different viewpoint. Yeah, right. Like, right? <laughs> like, come on, bro, come on. And I, I'm glad they mentioned it in the post game too, because apparently, um, coming into this season, they said that the referees were looking to make that more of an emphasis to call this year. And I think they said they only called it twice last year. This time in the Chief game was the 11th time it's been called this season. So Mahomes is up here talking about, I've, ne I've never even seen that be called. My whatever, he's never had it called against him in seven or eight years. It's like, okay, but it's been called. Like, it's not like it's not just pulling stuff out the rule book that they never use. And it doesn't mean that it's the wrong call. It is the right call. You're just mad that it was the right call against you. Right. And like I said, all of that is true. You still had three more shots at it to get the first down. So I don't want to hear anything about, oh, it took away the play, took away our chance to win, bro. Y'all just need to get in field goal range. Like you said, they got to be better. That all be better, bro. Be better, bro. It's that simple. Every problem can be solved if you're just better, bro. It's that Facts. simple. We complain about Facts. fantasy, bro. Score more points. Just tell you guys to get better, bro. Right. Work in your game, bro. Work in your game, young fella. Yeah. But that was crazy. I could I, we had to talk about that because I I really cannot believe he wouldn't have said that to Josh Allen, bro. Yeah, that that's the craziest part to me. Flipping on the refs, complaining post game to do it to Josh Allen. That to me was always the craziest part. He, and he didn't even respond. Josh was just like <laughs> tapped him on his chest, like, damn. <laughs> the fuck you want me to do? <laughs> like, right. What complaining like they was like I know they cool, but like playing like he was one of your boys at home. Like you played against him. Josh Allen liked that call. He was like, Yeah, no, good call, Rev. Good right. job. Crazy, it's crazy. Um, with that, we're gonna get into the last little bit of the show. Doing something a little bit different here. I've got some NBA trivia questions for you. Um I say these are like varying difficulty. Some of them are a little bit easier. The last one is a little tough, but we're going to see how these do. Cut them up into some some shorts. See how that goes. So let's we'll start man. with this. Start with this first one. Um, and I need you to name the top five players in career assists in the playoffs in NBA history. So all time. Bron. Bron is number two. Magic. Magic is number one. 
career assists in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. Bron Magic playoff. That's the that's the big part. Playoffs. Mm -hmm. Jason Kidd. That's a good poll. Jason Kidd is four. Steve Nash. Three and five. Steve Nash is not on the list. Really? That's interesting. John Stockton. John Stockton is three. Now you're and just I'm missing Omar. number five. Who was four? Jason Kidd? Jason Kidd was four. Hmm. Why am I blanking? Why am I? Chris Paul. Chris Paul is number five. I'm like that. Come on, man. I know my ball history. Okay, you clean you clean that one out pretty easy. Gets everyone wrong on the next yeah. one. <laughs> next one is a slight step up in difficulty. There have been six players since 1970 to win both the Rookie of the Year award and win finals MVP at some point in their career. Can you name all six players? In some point of their career. Okay, mm -hmm. got you. Michael Jordan. Yep. Lebr LeBron James. Mm hmm Since 1970 to win Rookie of the Year and Finals. Instead, in Finals MVP? Mm-hmm. Hmm. No, that's not him because he came in. He didn't win Rookie of the Year. Damn. Okay, okay. Tim Duncan. All of these, all, yeah, Tim Duncan is up there. It was okay. like all these guys are like household names. There's no there's no okay. tricks up here. Okay, guys. Well, I say Bron. I said Bron, MJ. And Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan. Mm -hmm. Uh Kareem. Nope. Really? He he was a rookie, I think, before 1970. Oh, okay. I'm bugging. I forgot about yeah. that part. Uh Magic. Magic did not win rookie of the year. Who won rookie of the year? Yeah, somebody, that's on, somebody that's on his list. <laughs> Larry Bird? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Okay, got you. That makes sense. <laughs> somebody from that class did it. <laughs> okay. Um, Shaq. Shaq X5. Now you're missing one. Mm, Kobe ain't one rookie year, I don't think. Mm -mm. Um, damn, I'm not just blanking. This right one now. is like sneakily maybe the hardest one. But he's again still still a household name on par with all the other names on this list. It's just not a guy that I think would come to mind when I'm thinking about stuff like this. Dirk. Not Dirk. Didn't win rookie of the year. D Wade? Not D Wade. I don't think D Wade run rookie of the year either. That the, the rookie of the year part is what's getting me. Like, damn. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> um you got to think, think about guys that came in the league hooping. All right, all right, let me just skip skip the the, the 90s because that was all Jordan. Yeah. Uh, damn. So damn. At, worst, at worst, you could just start rattling off finals. And maybe easy. Yeah, right. right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get it eventually. Came into the, uh, all right, let me just think recently and just go backwards. Uh, no, no, no. It wasn't this was Kitty. Kevin Durant. There we go. Okay. <laughs> there we go. All right. I, was, I started going backwards. I was like, Steph. Wait, no, Steph teammate, Katie. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. A little, little bit more difficult. This mm -hmm. last one. Last one's a little little hard. I'm not gonna lie. It's a little right, difficult. Next. I need you to name the top five scores in total points scored in NBA history among players who never made an all star team. Jesus Christ. Oh my God. You Did Jamal Crawford ever made an uh, Jamal Crawford? Number one. Okay. Third or 19.4 thousand points. Top five? Top five. Lou Williams. Lou Williams is not on the list. I think he's seventh. CJ McCollum. CJ McCollum is not on the list. He's somewhere Damn. further down. Damn. I just know he's like he didn't make an All Star team. Mm -hmm. So it's just Jamal Crawford's one. Bro, this is this might be a tough one. God I'll give damn. you I'll give you some hints. You definitely got to think. You got to think 
longevity. Like guys that are mean. that are bucket getters and just bent, they they just stayed in the league. <laughs> like damn. Is it all right? Is it is it some up there that's like not known for getting buckets, but it's just they've been in the league for a minute? I, I got would, a name. I would say one of them, yeah. Is it uh Andre Miller? Andre Miller is number five. Okay, I was about to say I know Andre Miller is one of them, but like yeah. he's not known for getting buckets. 16,200 uh, 16, points. Been in the league for a minute. He's not a Jeff, Jeff Green. Jeff Green is not on the list. He is like top 25. He hasn't been in the league. Man. I'm just going to start naming people that I think maybe not have made an all-star team. Tyreek Evans. Tyreek Evans is not on the list. I don't think he played enough. That Yeah, his stint was like too short. Yeah. Bro, this is nah, – I see what you mean. <laughs> this this it's is the hardest one. This is it's, hard. it's two names up here that you 100% know. And once you once you say them, you'll be like, ah, it makes so much sense. It's one guy up here, I'm not going to lie. I don't think you're going to get – he's just Damn. not not a guy that's going to come to mind. Can I get like a time period, like what – like a decade? Two of them were like – I don't – is he – he might be active right now. <clears throat> no, I don't think he is. So one of them was active, I think, all the way up until last season. The other one was last active in 2017-18. So this the guy that was active in 2017-18, he played from 1999 to 2018. The other guy played from uh, 17 years. So I guess that would be... Why I can't do math like 04 to like 2022. Did Monte Ellis make an all star team? He did, right? I believe he did. I don't think he's on the list. Steven Jackson. Oh, no. Monte Ellis did not make an all star team, but he's like top 10. Damn. Steven Jackson. Steven Jackson is not in the top five. I don't know where he is on the list. He might be way further down. Yeah, this is by far the hardest one. God damn. One of them. Is a uh, NBA 2K Hall of Famer for sure. Rudy Gay. Rudy Gay. <laughs> that's my guy. Okay, that's my guy right yeah. there. Rudy Gay. That jump shot is legendary. Right, seventeen thousand six hundred points. Yeah, number two and number three still left. Number two, I don't think you're gonna get. Number three is definitely gettable. He Gerald has Green? the most game played out of at everybody on this list. Not Gerald Green. I don't know if Gerald Green is – I don't know where he's at on this list. Hmm. Most games played out of everyone on the list. Vince Carter mm-hmm. made an all-star team. so He, he did, yep. Yeah. He's not up there. Who's a freaking elder statesman? God damn. Yo, bro. <laughs> I, I'm, all right, I'm going to give you the team this, he played for. Okay, I'm going to say this is that. You <laughs> might have got me on this yeah. one. This was tough. Started in Atlanta, uh, then went to Dallas. Uh, then wrapped up his career on some Jeff Teague, not Jeff Teague. Damn, wrapped up on some journeyman stuff Boston, Brooklyn, Houston, Milwaukee. But two biggest Brandon Jennings, Atlanta, and Dallas. Nope, not Brandon Jennings. Oh, that's crazy. That's wild. Michael Red, not Michael Red, <laughs> bro. This is alien, this not, is bro. Like... When you hear the name, you're gonna be like, Oh my gosh, oh, this is hard. This is gonna eat me. All right. This is the last hit. If I don't get it off this, I just – you won. <laughs> what position was he? Shooting guard. Of course. Of course he was a shooting guard. Why wouldn't you be a shooting guard? One-time champion. Aaron Afalo. Aaron Afalo is a crazy name. Not on, <laughs> not on the list, but – I'm just saying – but I'm just saying stuff. Bro. I'm just pulling names. He started his career with the Hawks. Went Hawks. Then Mavericks was his two main. Oh, no, no, he made all star team. No, 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 he definitely made all star team. He that did. One year that. was four. So it was <laughs> that, that sixty win Hawks team with Budenholzer. Right. Demar Carroll got left out. That's so tough. Imagine everybody else in the starting five makes the all star team, but right. you. But like, damn, I'm just the weak link. My bad. Sure. Yeah, you might have. Yeah, you might have got me, bro. I don't know. Okay, so the guy I don't think you're gonna get is Eddie Johnson. Nah, I wasn't uh, getting that. Yeah. 
No, he played for the the Kansas City Kings. Is this a is an ABA team? This shouldn't even count, bro. I didn't <laughs> realize that. Now I'm looking at it. Was Eddie? I uh, thought Eddie Johnson was on the Lakers. Hold on, maybe I might be thinking of a different Eddie Johnson. Uh, this guy played oh, no, for. No, no. Whoa, I'm thinking about. <laughs> completely different. Yeah. This is. I was not getting this guy. Yeah, Kings Stuns. He played for 17 years. You imagine that pulled off? I was just like Eddie Johnson, first name. I don't, bro. I don't lost. I don't like no way. When I put it together, I'm like, I don't think he's gonna get five solely off of him. <laughs> so that was number two. He has um nineteen thousand two hundred and two, so two hundred less than Jamal Crawford off the bench. Or off the bench, uh, without all star appearance. The number three guy on this list went from Atlanta to Dallas. Jason Terry. You gotta be kidding me, bro. There's no <laughs> way I don't get Jason Terry, bro. 18,881 points with zero all star appearances. That is such a oh, I should have got that one, bro. There's no way I don't get Jason. Terry. He's like, I see what you mean. Like, there's no way I didn't get Jason Terry. That's crazy. He was a super bug of them early year. I mean, he's a bug coming out of Arizona, but those early years in Atlanta, bro, 19.7 points per game. I mean, even when he was older, when he was older, he was still giving you some solid points off the bench. Oh, yeah. And that three ball was always there. Facts. Three ball was always there. Ah, Damn, yeah. That's, that's a tough one. That's a t- I, I, when I put it together. I was like, that's a tough, that's just a tough thing to think about. Like most, most points score without making an all star game. It's, it's hard. And it's like, bro, my mind is going from anywhere between like 2000 to like now. Like it's just so, a, it's just a, a, a list of names in my brain, bro. It's, yeah. it's tough. That was good. No, that was fun. I like yeah. That no, one. we'll definitely have to pull these out more often. Uh, Cause low key stat muse to make it like, I literally can type in stat muse, like most career points without all-star appearances. You can <laughs> have, you can put so specific list. stats and stat muse. Like it's, it's right. fire. I low key before this, I was trying to pull up like most dunks in postseason history, but it was like they don't track dunks. Damn. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we'll definitely, definitely have to get more of these going. Ah, uh, anything else you want to talk about before we wrap up the pod? Um, I can't even ask you about who you think gonna win the night's games because like it's Titans, Dolphins, ew, and like Packers, Giants. Like, who really cares? Jordan Love, keep the hot streak going. Hey man, I hope so. You know, because it was it was besmirching his name a little bit, but you, you never know. That boy, Tommy DeVito, <laughs> he, he's so bad, bro. But that's so it's just like <laughs> and somebody was like, I saw a video, somebody was like, bro, he is the worst, coolest quarterback ever. Because like that's everybody bad. loves him, but he's not good at all. Yeah, <laughs> his story is just fire. Yeah, it's pure vibes. It's pure vibes. Sometimes that's all you need. I would love to be just a vibey NFL backup. That's the right. best job in the world. Definitely. Definitely would be. Um, bro, this Giants team is rough. I just click on these stats, and it's like he's he has played one less game than Daniel Jones, and he's still like 300 yards shy of him passing. Sick. It's not good all around, bro. Yeah, bad. NBA is back at least tonight, though, because I know they took the break from the in season tournament. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll probably watch a few while I watch it. I'll probably just flip between. If I'm watching this Dolphins game, it's strictly fantasy purposes. There's no reason. Oh, 100 percent. It's no other reason. Oh, and they said uh, Lakers are they they hoisting a banner for the, I, I the NBA that. Cup. I you know that's that. gonna get tore up on Twitter, bro. Bro, all right, listen. I need people. Listen, and I'm gonna call you out. You're probably not watching this, but I'm gonna call you out, Drew. Not our, not pick a side, Drew. There's a guy named Drew on Twitter. Yeah, he's a he's a Clippers he's a Clippers Twitter guy. First of all, I love I love the tweets because he gets cooked every time. It's so funny because you're a Clippers guy. Like you have nothing to fall back on, bro. Y'all got oh, no you talk about the one you talk about. We'll see come June. Yeah, yeah, bro. Like that was man. crazy. Bro, listen, I see all I see all the tweets. I really do. I faithfully look at the tweets. Cause he gets cooked every time. It's like accounts like him. There's a few others that I know just off mm-hmm. of like if I see it. But like, bro, people are trying to like trash our, our in-team tournament win. Like we don't have the real championships to back it up. Some of y'all, bro, have I A never won one or B never been alive to see y'all win one, bro. 
I saw us win one a couple years ago. Don't get me wrong. It was like four years ago now. But still, right. I saw two, three. You know what I mean? Like, listen, man. Yeah, I, I need to stop the hate. The hate is bad. The hate is bad for your heart, man. Just accept the fact that, bro, y'all organizations are poverty franchises, bro. And we're just, that's just what we do. Like, it's, it's tough. I love the tweets. Though. They're funny. They're definitely like engagement farms. Like, crazy, oh, 100%. Bro. But like, it'd be to, working. It'd be funny. To say that is crazy. Like, <laughs> they, they're going to post, put up their in season <clears> tournament <throat> banner. We'll see. We'll be playing when it matters in June. <laughs> Everybody under the comments, like, the Clippers may never have played a game in June outside of, <laughs> of the bubble in right. franchise history. Bro. <laughs> bro, and it's like, bro, y'all be discrediting like stuff y'all could win. Like, right. y'all won in the bubble. Y'all blew a 3 1 lead in the bubble. That's way worse. Like, what, right. bro? Like, that type of stuff just is, kills me, bro. Because it'd be different if, like, all right, we was the only team that had a chance. Right. Y'all were right there. Y'all just blew it. Facts, facts, facts. What are they going to in season tournament? I don't even remember what their record. One and three. Exactly, bro. Y'all just didn't, yeah, bro. It's like it'd be different if they was like, we don't care about the little stuff, and they they have mad chips to back it up. Then I right. couldn't talk. Y'all just win nothing. Y'all, y'all can't even win the fake stuff, quote unquote. Y'all can't. <laughs> y'all can't get a Mickey Mouse. Y'all can't get a Mickey Mouse ring. Like, come on, bro. What are we talking about? It sound it sound like facts to me, bro. It's so funny. I love it though. It's hilarious. I love the engagement. It is so funny. Yeah, that's. <laughs> I see. I as soon as you mentioned the name, I was like, I know exactly what tweet you were talking about. And he was getting cooked up for it. He was getting fried, bro. And it'd be all. It's always him getting cooked, bro. Cause he'll post something and just not even know what he's talking about, bro. It's so funny. Oh my god. Oh, man. With that, though, that's going to wrap up episode 43 of the Off the Glass podcast. If you made it this far in the episode, we appreciate you as always. If you're watching on YouTube, again, like, comment, subscribe to the channel and go over to the audio platforms, drop a five star rating and pre download the show. Continue to follow us on social platforms as well at Off the Glass Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off the Glass Podcast on TikTok. Um, As always, we appreciate you. We're going to keep grinding these out we almost to episode 50 just Damn. crazy like bro we really almost at 50 crazy, halfway bro. to 100 crazy uh yeah we're gonna see y'all next time and we out peace yes sir